Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to come here. It was a great pleasure. Today I will introduce to you a very large so-called future project of our chancellor called Industry for Zero. We use the German spelling because it's uh, the idea emerged in Germany. Let me start by just saying that today 90% of all computers are actually embedded. Not in laptops, not in smartphones, but they are embedded in devices. So after a phase where we had a central computer, you know, in 1941, at least in Germany, Konrad Zuse had the first digital computer, then we have uh, the PC era, but now we are in the post-PC era, so that all of us carry around a lot of computers. When we go to a BMW car, you have seven computers. If you go to the Airbus, you have more than 400. You are actually sitting in a computer. And what I want to do today is to show that there is a very large and very interesting application area, at least uh, for some European countries, in uh, factory automation. That we, that's the next step to introduce smart factories as a kind of intelligent environment. And this will be the heart of my talk. So what is a smart factory? Basically, very simply, it's a network of intelligent objects. All the machines in the uh, factory are networked via internet, no field bus. It's all IP factory. And as I will show, it's not only the mach machines, but it's also the emerging products. So the products are also networked with the machines and uh, what is emerging is a kind of marketplace. So we use a service-oriented abstraction metaphor to say the machines provide a service to the emerging product. So this is a revolution in thinking in factory automation. Why do we call it a first industrial revolution? You all know from school books the first one was um, a mechanical uh, revolution, then Henry Ford and others, you know, using electricity for mass production, that's called in textbook and Wikipedia the uh, second revolution. The third revolution also already involved some IT, um, the first robots, very heavy robots, uh, are still in place for, you know, welding for instance. They are very dangerous, uh, like the lions in caves in the factory. And now the false revolution, that's my topic today, is emerging. And this is based on cyber physical systems, embedded computers, talking products, and a new generation of robots which actually can collaborate with humans. Not in caves like the lion, but they collaborate, they have humanoid um, behavior partially, and they really are so-called lightweight robotics, so they can't <coughs> harm human. The complexity, of course, is increasing, so this is a challenge for computer science. We have to use other abstraction methods. Let me just, uh, in a short video, try to capture what the uh, fourth revolution in the industry is from our point of view. Um, Today, machines, factories, and ideas are first simulated before being implemented. Machine productivity <coughs> depends on the performance of the program. In the future, machines can perhaps even identify the potential for optimization automatically, coordinate among themselves, and involve humans if needed. But that's not all. Machinery and plants have to be even more flexible in the future. This is our smart factory. From mass produced goods. Increasingly important are highly individualized products that can nevertheless be produced efficiently. To enable a rapid adaptation to changing requirements, consistently defined interfaces are needed. Principles like plug and play can also be implemented <coughs> in production and considerably reduce the effort involved in the conversion of a plant. The smart product knows everything about its individual configuration its customer, and its destination. The soap bottles with white stoppers have different destinations than the soap bottles with black stoppers. <coughs> in the future, components such as the Bosch diesel injector will be produced in small quantities and in real time. The production starts only after somewhere in the world a car maker has actually placed a concrete order. 
The order form not only contains all information about technical requirements, but also about destination and client. The information is embedded in the component and is capable of managing the production process, for example, by ordering missing components. Simultaneously, customers are kept informed of the current state of production. So that's the vision. There are various economic and social drivers behind this. We all know we have shorter product life cycles. Every few months we have a new iPhone or whatever. Increasing product variability. So uh, there are millions of different options when you order your Mercedes or BMW. Uh, the batch size goes down in many cases to one. Actually, it's a kind of mass customization will become possible. Or in general, it's low volume, high mixture production. We want, of course, resource efficient, green, and what we call urban production. We want to bring the factory with zero emission back to the cities so that we don't have a lot of transportation of the workers. We have dynamic value chain networks, very volatile markets, cost reduction pressures, and finally also the human aspect. We have an aging society, at least in Europe, and a lack of skilled workforce, unfortunately. So all these parameters are the drivers, both economic and social, behind this. Batch size one, what does it mean? When you go to the internet in Germany and uh, want to have a cereal, it's called My Muesli as a service, custom mixed cereals, you can go and configure a muesli from 100 different ingredients on your PC, and this muesli will be manufactured you know, according to your specification. And actually, more than 500 billion variations can be done because there are 100 ingredients and uh, the muesli can be configured in such a way that in a five gram scale you can mix all the stuff and if you do the combinatorics it's really hard. How do you manufacture this? It's very simple, the emerging product, that means the package of the muesli has the information and then it drives along with a kind of taxi, the, the intelligent carrier, along all these filling stations and tells the filling station how much of the stuff you know, nuts or whatever, uh, should go in. Very simple idea, and here you already see the idea of the inversion of the logistic process. It was my idea of the active memory, where actually there is no uh, central control saying, now comes this package, please fill in. But the package tells the machine that it wants some uh, features. And this is a most a very simple example. Of course, we use this in other batch size one factories. A good example is kitchen factories. Uh, in Germany, we have the largest kitchen manufacturer in Europe. They produce 2,600 kitchens per day. Every kitchen is another one. It should fit to your home. So 40 million variants uh, are produced. And again, it's fully automatic. We have the cyber physical systems installed there. We have on uh, the panels which are used here, already the information, how they should be driven. So this idea of the future of the project, the political thing is that, at least in Germany, every second uh, work job still depends on production. Uh, as you know, a lot of things are exported, industrial products, especially in Germany, machine tools to China, to India, also to the States, automotive industry, of course, very important. And now we want to go, you know, in innovation to the next step that we say we have to be prepared for the next manufacturing wave. And this is machine to machine communication. As I said, all IP factories without any central manufacturing execution system, but completely distributed to be highly flexible. The embedded digital product memory tells the machines which production services are needed, green and urban production, and another idea is that we use these platforms like cars. We, just a half year ago we introduced the first app store for BMW or an app store for a laser building machine. That means that we have also some possibilities for after sales with smart product services and you know using the platform, not the iPad but a laser welding machine to also have sell some software to make it either 
more efficient, more environmentally friendly, or very important for the human aspect to have another user interface on top of this machine. So we are preparing for this, and this means that first of all we get uh, rid of all the bus systems. It's really a, a very bad in today's cars. We have four different uh, bus systems in the normal factory. Uh, we counted in the Bosch factory over 20 different bus systems, so-called field buses. Very um, old design, sometimes uh, really completely incompatible. And what we have done now, we have the first uh, car running actually from um, BMW, where we have only IP. Everything is okay. Even the braking is done on industrial Ethernet, very uh, real time Ethernet. It's IP based. The same in our factory. We have now several factories which uh, allow only IP communication between all the components. This is one thing introducing the Internet of Things to manufacturing. Now, when we prepared this for the German government, I did this together with the chair of SAP. Uh, we uh, first designed a national roadmap for embedded systems, then we went on to cyber physical systems, embedded systems like the airbag, uh, network embedded systems like intelligent street crossing, car to X communication. But now we are on the level of the cyber physical systems when we have larger systems, actually systems of systems of systems, like the smart factory or the smart grid research. We were able to convince our chancellor, this is a very big national program, <coughs> we spent 500 million euro for three years, so it's really quite a large funding program. And today I want to go into some technical details, only two aspects, namely First, the role of active semantic product memories, and then to show that we are able to have an abstraction hierarchy which allows us to have use semantic web services in a service-oriented model to describe what's going on in the smart factory. So let's start very simply with the idea of an individual product memory. One can say it's simply a kind of black box, a event recorder in the product. So there is a small embedded system which records a live log, not of people, not of a, uh, but of a physical <coughs> artifact. When it's emerging in the factory, it has sensors, very small actuators, <coughs> so it can tell you the story of the life. So it's a complete life cycle management. <coughs> and we implement this sometimes with very Simple things that like you know two-dimensional barcode, but then everything has to be in the network, of course, the memory. But more and more in most of the current applications, we embed small chips which have some capacity to store, even the communication capacity, or if it's a car, the black box is even a small, you know, mini micro uh, PC. So what does this memory uh, do? First it gives the product the capability to become an information container. For instance, this blister pack which the drugs knows when it was produced, when it was shipped, and so on. The product is also an agent. So our robots now read the information from this emerging product to find the crib point. So the product tells the robot the weight, good crib points. So it's actually not only the sensory system of the robot, but it's the product itself telling something. And this is done by, again, by the product memory. And then also the product is an observer, because we equip it with these simple sensors, so the product can complain, for instance, that the environmental condition is not good. So for trucks, for instance, humidity or the temperature is very important, so they start complaining to the environment. How is this implemented? We use very small, uh, so-called digi-connect systems. These are um, ARM processors which uh, have Ethernet capability. It's like a piece of sugar. When I went to the, uh, the cafeteria this morning, I mean, you see the typical sugar piece. This is the size. We have these uh, small devices at each component in the factory. Uh, they have, the antenna is bigger than the uh, device itself and you want to do it with Wi-Fi. And uh, it is a micro web server, it's based on Linux, and we use OPC UA on the Ethernet for machine-to-machine -machine communication. 
And uh, this means when we build up our first smart factory at DFPI, that we heavily instrument all the equipment. This is a, a production line which we did for um, having mass customization of hair shampoo. So we can, when you go there, you say, I want to have pink hair shampoo with some, you know, smells from, I don't know, uh, some flower roses or so. This is produced on the spot, and you see all these stitching connect stuff is measuring uh, and uh, transmitting information between the components. And when you have the bottle, the bottle itself knows what kind of hair shampoo <coughs> it should get. You see the R5D ship is there, and it tells the machine you want to have blue shampoo in this case. So what we have here is the cyber physical um, digital object memory consists of course of the memory itself, some microcentral systems, microprocessor. Uh, we have some positioning chips in some applications, a radio module, actuators, and some of these chips also have their own energy supply by energy or energy harvesting units. Of course, this is reflected on the software side with uh, state transition logics, uh, processing logic, sensor interpretation components, and so on. Um, but the most important, I think, is that uh, Barbara also will talk about this abstraction layers. We had to go, you know, the old factory automations are was only about bits and bytes, field buses, and so on. Uh, actually, it was still kind of assembly programming. Then, in software engineering, the functional level came up, so, so of course, if we abstract the way it is uh, by our functions, but this is also not enough. I mean, if you want to program such a factory just in straight Java, it won't work. Uh, so what we have done is uh, we went to the level of semantic service descriptions. We use a factory ontology, and uh, heavily semantic uh, technologies are really embedded. So from bits and bytes to semantics, that was a very important step. Why? Because here we are working in a world of open loop. In, in manufacturing, you cannot say we are in a closed loop system because even the logistic company is normally not owned uh, by, by BMW, it's another company. Then, of course, the sales organizations may be a company, the other company. And at least also you want to give access to this memory also to the end customer. This is very important. So we cannot deal with ad hoc data formats if we go to the world of open loop. In the open loop, you have to have a semantic description with a real model theoretic semantics, which can be downloaded, which is well defined, so that uh, things are interoperable. This was one of our major tasks. And actually, uh, DFK is also running the office of W3C. So I'm heavily involved in W3C. We have in W3C a new standard, which we call the object memory uh, model. You can download it OMM from the W3C web sites, it um, has had the incubation phase, it's now in the standardization process to be finalized, and the main idea is that it heavily uses metadata to describe the payload blocks of the different stages during the life cycle of the product, from the specification of the manufacturing, logistics, and so on, and all uh, these uh, stakeholders in the process can use their own formats, but the formats all have to have a meta description so that they become machine readable. So if you have such a, um, a payload uh, uh, of the process owner, we really define the namespace uh, which uh, format is used, so a pointer to the ontology which is used, of course the access history, and then we have some verbal description so that also humans can from time to time check uh, what's going on on the product memory. So for machine-to-machine -machine communication, the most important, of course, is that we have this formal uh, description. Here's a, a simple example of the ORM code. It's using OWL. I think many of you, you know, uh, use or know the OWL standard, this ontology web language. It's already heavily used in industry for the description of semantic objects. There is also a special variant OWL S, which I'm going to use, this is a service description. It's a description logic, and on top of this, we now have a meta description to describe the different stakeholders 
in the process. We see it here um, that we always have pointers in the code to uh, the uh, semantic uh, variants which we are using. This works very well. We are already using it in three different factories in uh, Germany. Uh, Service-oriented planning means that every single device in the uh, factory is described in its behavior by uh, such a ontology. Let me give you a, a precise example. Here, for instance, we have an inductive uh, sensor and a stopper in the machine. So in the process, the uh, object must be stopped shortly because there's a reading uh, of a D reader going to read some <coughs> material. And uh, each object, like in the Internet of Things, of course, has its own IP address, of course. A operation, the stopper, of course, the operation is hold. So it's uh, described on the uh, functional level. And then by functional composition, of course, we get to higher and higher you know, processes so that we can describe the whole manufacturing process by the, such a sequence of um, hierarchical functional models. That's the basic idea. To give a complete example, let me run through this very simple product. We actually uh, implemented this as a showcase of the last CBIT for our chancellor. We have the uh, very simple device. It's a key finder. You need it when you always you lose your iPhone or your key uh, because they are just using a Bluetooth connection and the iPhone tracks uh, with the last uh, signal of your keys and when, when the distance is too large, and very simple electronics here, uh, then it's starting peeping, uh, peeping and warning you that you forgot your keys. Um, to produce this, however, mm -hmm. in, uh, we have the semantic product memory chip in the back cover, which is just a plastic frame. When this uh, object is emerging, we put uh, this information onto the object. Then the uh, production process is started. And the production process is now a past planning based on this semantic product memory discussion. Here it's very simple. Select the top shell, <coughs> get the circuit into the Bluetooth uh, chip, should be uh, packaged. Um, here, in case we said it should be individualized, so engrave, you know, Angela Merkel or something in, onto this uh, shell, and then do the example. So four basic steps. And now the product uses uh, the service descriptions and does some simple service discovery or what's called semantic service matching to find the machines which can provide the service. And then it uses another cyber physical system which is what we call the intelligent carrier. You can think about a taxi. You go to the taxi and say, drive me to this, yeah, to this. Uh, and, uh, because you, now you know which machine it can service you. Yeah? And the interesting thing is, of course, the robustness, because if a machine fails, we can just go to another service, which does the equivalent. Also, we have a lot of freedom for optimization, which I will show you in a minute. So it's all about you know, uh, service discovery, service matching, and then execution. This is uh, our intelligent uh, carrier. It's uh, the taxi. It's itself uh, a physical system. It reads the description of the emerging product and then looks where should this go. And uh, again, has wireless connections to all the machines and is negotiating when is a good point in time to be there at the station. This dynamic planning means that. Um, from this abstract uh, process uh, specification, we can say, please go to fast track production. So we want to have this key finder manufacturing, manufacturing at a certain you know, uh, threshold in the time window. It's, it's like an anytime algorithm. You, you have to do it at a certain point. The product should be ready to ship. Then, of course, we cannot you know, go to an energy optimization because uh, if you want to have the fast track, it's a bit more expensive. And actually, what happens in the planning process yeah, of to, to which machines you should go, uh, this is uh, used, uh, this uh, uh, knowledge, this side condition. If I say, produce the same thing with a green production in mind, so minimize CO2, because the CO2 level is also imprinted on the product memory, when you go with your smartphone, actually go to the uh, uh, product, you can read how much CO2 was used in manufacturing, 
this possible, and then the green assembly process using other equipment will be followed. Now, if one machine doesn't work, again, using the abstract process maybe, you, you look for another plan. So all these plans are generated on the fly in a very efficient way, and actually, we also can have plug and produce if you decide to introduce a new machine. In instantaneously, this machine can be used. Why is this? As I said, because all uh, the components are described by our S. We have uh, our devices, device ontology, we have the operation ontology, and then in the service ontology, this is used to describe uh, the functionality of various services of various machines. And uh, I talked about plug and produce. So if we install a new assembly unit, and this was a big shock for our industrial uh, collaborators. We really showed that after about 30 seconds, we introduce a new machine. The whole system is, is operating again. Why is this? Because you see it here. The machine, this component, brings its own ontology. The ontology is automatically expanded into the service ontology here. You see this component comes in, and here we see the extension. And then it's ready to go because the metaphor which is used for plant generation is so simple yeah, that, of course, if there's a new component, it's a service which can be discovered by the emerging product. So it will be used instantaneously, if necessary, in the production process. This is also very important because right now, if you go to a big factory, some of them need about two weeks until a new component can run again, the whole factory can't work, and this is another very important step in high volume, high mix production that you are able to adapt to new devices which come in uh, more or less instantaneously. As I said, another extremely important topic in our domain is that we want to be resource optimal. The production planning in such a scheme, and this was a constraint our chancellor gave us, that we should save about 30% energy in production by introducing also stop-start mechanisms like you use it in your car. <laughs> now if you go with your car to a, a traffic sign which is red, normally you, know, you can shut down the car. The uh, car comes up automatically when you uh, hit the gas pedal in the fuel-based car. And the same idea for factories, because now in normal manufacturing, all the machines are busy. When they start Monday morning, they you know, start all the machines. And this is really uh, bullshit in a sense, because a lot of energy is lost. So what we uh, do is, first of all, with our cyber physical systems, we have complete control of every single component. We measure the energy. We also use dynamic price ranges, because we have the energy transition. We want to go to completely uh, renewable energies. And this means that the prices will fluctuate a lot during the day. So we have to uh, also uh, have this our goal function. So what we are doing is for each, uh, every single component, we say, OK, the component may be ready, but this costs a lot of energy. We can go to step by one, step by two, or switch it off altogether. And now, during the dynamic uh, process of scheduling, a task for a merchant product, we try to minimize energy by cutting off all the components which are not necessary in the next few minutes. So it's quite complex uh, uh, optimization problem. Actually, we use price time uh, automata. And you see here in a simple example, even for sensors or simple motors to drive the conveyor belt, we uh, have uh, a large variety of, of you know, how much ampere, volt ampere they are using. For instance, this motor uh, in the standby low mode only needs 80 uh, volt ampere, whereas uh, if it's uh, in production, 132, of course, you can shut it off completely, but sometimes some components need some time. If you have moving objects to accelerate, they, they are not ready to produce instantaneously, so you need a little bit of a leak. <coughs> 
And uh, so this is uh, very nicely also theoretically this is, uh, uh, in planning, to, to do planning, temporal planning with such resource constraints. And actually what we have done here uh, is very much in line with what Eric and uh, Patrick Doherty has done with their non-monotonic temporal logics because it's really non-monotonic because uh, sometimes you get later a, a signal, the price of the energy is going down now, you cannot predict, so this is dynamic. And uh, also, uh, as I said, some component may be added, or some component which is later in the planning may fail, and then you have you know to to replan. So it's completely non-monotonic. And uh, the the theory of, of Eric, we haven't done <laughs> all the work. We we implemented, we use time automatic, but we want to do a better description on a higher level using uh, your theoretical framework, Eric. Location-based industrial <coughs> system becomes possible. So of course we have also workers in this factory. You see a guy running around in our test factory uh, with a tablet and looking at the individual components, the, the um, energy consumption to do some optimization. Because EDA is about human-centered um, systems, I think uh, I should also mention what it means for the factory workers. So um, we work on, as you have seen, just mobile, personalized, situation-aware tutoring systems, <coughs> a multimodal human-machine interaction in the factory. <coughs> we use a lot of um, augmented reality, physical assistance by using exoskeletons, and context-adaptive assistance. As I said, for instance, for Trumpf, which is the largest, worldwide largest laser welding one, Company, we already established an app store where you can, for you know, 5,000 euros, have a, 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 a new high precision app. So the laser welding is much more precise, or it's all software configurable. Or you have a green button here where you can download software which saves energy and so on. So it's a, also a good uh, economic model to sell the machine, but then also apply app stores. Another very important thing. <coughs> We got the first uh, glasses from Google uh, a couple of months ago, and we already have an implementation where we have the Google glasses for the industrial workers and give them in situ training with these new machines. Because uh, introducing new components is one thing, but then you have to train the workforce um, to use them. And because it's very volatile, you cannot go to a PowerPoint seminar, you should do it on the machine, and so uh, augmented reality now with Google glasses really becomes um, uh, possible. And as I said, in robotics also, it's a shift of the paradigm here that we really work together. You see, uh, today we still have the robot in a cave. Sometimes it's not a physical cave, but just you know, uh, by sensors. So you don't touch, don't come too near. But in the future, we have the first ones which are working together with humans. For instance, in the Mercedes manufacturing, the guy introduced a system in the cockpit of the car where a human worker works together with such a lightweight robot. Uh, you can really push away the robot if it comes too close to you or you don't like what it is doing right now with you. Uh, so no, no danger. Uh, so very highly equipped with uh, sensors. Um, we thought we should also have a female robot, so we call it femrod. This is one of the, these uh, robots. And as I said, it has in its hand also an NFC reader, so it reads while touching the object. It reads information from the product memory, as I said, the size, the weight, the lifting points, the whole CAD model is encoded there. So uh, also we, have, of course, have laser sensors and cameras and so on. This helps a lot to have a very good adaptation. Anyway, if you want to know more about it, I just uh, prepared a, a book about the semantic product memory in the Springer series. I give it to, to Eric as a gift from it for you. Um, but it's available also as a to download. President Obama visited recently Germany in Berlin, and I had the honor also to discuss with him a little bit. And he said, you know, in the US, uh, it's really unfortunate that we were in our production um, industry. He commissioned uh, the MIT group, he called it Manufacturing Task Force. They will uh, print out a book, it's not really, uh, I have a, a pre 
release uh, will appear shortly before Christmas. It's called Making in America, where uh, he says we need a reindustrialization. And it was really nice to see that he said, the, you know, in Germany, uh, the production industry was always, you know, on top. And I think uh, when we had the economic crisis here in Europe, it was very important to have some <coughs> production. I think without physical production, I don't believe, next talk is about Google. Google is very good. But I think from an economic point of view, only Google, I mean, you cannot have the workforce only in computer science. <coughs> you need really physical production, not only low cost, but uh, in the mass customization market, it's very important. And I think uh, CPS, and what I told you today, is for Europe extremely important to be uh, to have a competition in economics over the next years. So let me conclude. Cyber physical production systems and semantic product memories are the foundations for what we call industry for zero. We introduce the Internet of Things into factories. The semantic product memory controls, as I said, the production process in a very distributed fashion based on a semantic service architecture. This semantic service architecture is based again on production ontologies, on ubiquitous micro web servers on the hardware level, and realizes, as I said, intelligent matchmaking between processes uh, of the machines and emerging products and production tasks. Active semantic product memories use semantic web technologies, agent technologies, resource aware and constraint based planning and scheduling, one of the topics which is very strong here, I think, is the shipping, and intelligent sensor interpretation based on AI research. I would like to thank here everybody who uh, supported us uh, over the years, especially Eric, but I mentioned also Patrick, Krista, Backstrom, I don't know whether he is here, we had a very good collaboration in planning, <coughs> theory, uh, as a, a, you know, to look at the algorithms of planning, Lars, Niels, Anna in the human uh, center computing and collaboration, and uh, DFK only is 25 years, we also had a celebration to, uh, for 25 years, not yet 30, but we always had a very strong collaboration. I was all able to pick some stuff. We have, I have at least two people working at DFK from the Germany. We were involved in one of, of PhD supervision, and I'm very proud to be also an honorary doctor here of the Thank you very much for this. Thank you.